Thank you very much, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar uh, hosted by APMG International and in conjunction with ALC about uh, Enterprise Big Data Professional Certification. And welcome, Paul Colmer from Brisbane, Australia. How are you this afternoon, Paul? Thank you so much, Laurie. I'm so excited to be here. Um, thank you to everyone for joining the call today. We're going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to step you through the Enterprise Big Data Professional. Um, let's get going. Back to you, Laurie. Thanks, Paul. We, if you'd like to just set some contact details for us so that we have our, our email addresses that Paul will just put up on the screen. There's Paul's uh, email address from ALC Training and Consulting. I'm located in Canberra and I look after APMG International's business in Australia and New Zealand. Now let's discuss just some housekeeping. The session is being recorded. The recording and slides will be sent to you after the webinar. Um, all participants are muted. Please type any questions into the questions window. Uh, we do a lot of webinars and I would urge you to have a look at what's being, uh, what is actually in the, uh, on, the, in the, on the APMG website. Uh, but if there are any suggestions and comments, we'd urge you to contact Mark Constable. For questions, um, there is a question panel on your control panel on your right of your screen. Um, please type in the questions. We will endeavour to answer those. There's, uh, there are a number of breaks during the session this afternoon where we can uh, answer your questions. Uh, unfortunately, if you are on a mobile device, uh, this functionality uh, is not available. But please email us any questions that you feel we might want to, that you might want to raise. Paul, very much looking forward to an entertaining half an hour. Over to you. Thank you so much, Laurie. Thank you to all of you for attending uh, this session today. Uh, let me extend a very warm welcome to you all um, as we work through the Enterprise Big Data Professional Certification. So a little bit about me, guys. So my name is Paul Colmer. I am, as Laurie said, a trainer um, and digital coach with ALC Training and Consulting. As you can see, I'm very busy in my spare time. I am a music composer. Um, I'm also a Queensland State Emergency Service volunteer, and I have been known from time to time to do a bit of stand-up comedy. Fortunately, though, you'll all be very relieved to know that I won't be doing any singing today. Um, I won't be handing out any storm damage advice, and I certainly won't be telling any jokes. That's mainly because my routine isn't that clean, so that, that's really the reason. OK, on to the next slide. So I want th three key takeaways for you guys to take away from this. Um, the first thing is um, the first thing is to give you a bit of a break from work. So hopefully this is going to be a bit of a fun uh, session. Like I said, ask lots of questions. Second key takeaway, and this is more important, um, I get to tantalize you with some engaging stories. So rather than actually presenting uh, a set of very boring slides, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've done um, in my data science sort of career and some of the things I've explored the last couple of years. Um, and thirdly, um, I'd love to persuade you all to join me um, in Sydney and Melbourne on our debut Enterprise Big Data courses. So they're three day courses. You can see the dates on the screen in Melbourne and Sydney. Love to see you guys. Um, and of course, have the time of your life. Um, so just click on the link or, or um, take a screenshot of the link. Like I said, these, these slides will be available later and you can have a look for yourselves. So, so this certification is the first in a trilogy of four. Yes, four. So this is number one, the enterprise big data professional. You can see there's analyst, uh, data scientist, and then on to engineer. Um, this is beautifully illustrated by the slide you see in front of you. It's a foundational entry level course designed for anybody to attend, um, both business people and people with an interest in big data. The most important thing um, if you do come to the courses, is to turn up at 9 a.m. sharp, bring your passion and enthusiasm for big data with you, um, and we'll have a lot of fun. Very simply, it leads to a fantastic certification. So the great thing about this course is it does lead to a cert. Um, it's a multiple choice exam. Um, it's underwritten by the APMG group, who are kindly hosting this webinar today. It's a 90 minute exam it's closed book unfortunately um, but the great news is it's 65 percent to pass and you'll be awarded with a digital badge you can proudly display your digital badge on linkedin um, to show off your big data knowledge prowess and expertise to your friends and adoring fans 
or you can simply use the uh, digital badge to add some color to your LinkedIn profile. The choice is yours. So the way the um, certification series works, we, we outlined it was a, this is the first book in a book of four, um, is it talks, we talk about a big data framework. Um, so the first book is very much structured around this and it contains six separate categories, which you can see on the diagram in front of you. Let me talk you through those categories. So I've got some notes here on the right hand side. If I look across you, you'll know why. The first thing is, is, is big data strategy. That's the triangle sort of in the middle how to create and communicate a clear vision and establish a differentiated strategy. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is architecture, how to create solutions that align to that strategy. Number three is algorithms. What are the mathematical techniques that we could choose from to help us realize our business goals? Number four, big data processes right at the bottom, um, how to embed lasting knowledge and expertise in your organization. To the left is big data functions, how to structure a big data practice and enable lasting cultural change. That's really important, that cultural change piece. And then finally, the one that everyone likes to talk about, artificial intelligence, um, which we will touch on after the questions in a moment. Um, so what is machine learning? What is deep learning? And how do I gain business benefits for employing those types of technologies and techniques? Final slide here before we get into some initial questions. Um, are some of the business drivers around uh, big data? Um, there are huge drivers at the moment around improving the customer experience. Um, there are lots of different uh, use cases around automation. So the Tesla Model S, Model X, and Model 3, uh, you see a lot of work from Elon Musk and team automating the Tesla series through automation. That's one example. Um, and then you see a, a lot of safety use cases as well. How can we improve safety? How can we remove people from a dangerous environment and replace with a level of automation, but also understanding what that data looks like and how we can make better decisions in the future. So do we have any questions? Let's have a look. Laurie. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we do have a, a question. Um, the person said, I, I, one of the people, and thanks, uh, uh, John for putting this in. I work in a small to medium business. Is there a course that, um, is this a course that could benefit me or, or who else could benefit? Um, and John's also said, would an in-house course be a better option? Um, good question, John. A small to medium business, medium to business, would this course benefit them? A great question. Thanks, John. So yes, um, the answer is yes, of course. Um, some of the benefits I think from any size of business um, is really um, how you can apply uh, some of the knowledge that you learn in, in a business context. So one of the things, and we'll, I'll demonstrate this sort of in this presentation, is I'll give you some real live use cases. So we'll often talk about real uses of data, particularly for a small and medium business, sales and marketing are critical. You know, getting uh, sales into that front end pipeline are, are really, really important. Um, there's a lot of data in social media, there's a lot of data in media marketing. Um, so I'll talk about some of those use cases and, and that, that could be the, the way in which that company benefits from this type of course. Um, mm. In terms of the question around in-house courses, um, it really depends on, on, on the size and how many, how many people you're looking to run this. So ideally, we'd like to uh, run this in-house because we can tailor the course for the organization. And typically you need five or more people to typically make it worth your while to run in-house. Um, but you can, you can come to public if there are fewer people than that. Um, does that answer the question? Did I answer that well? Yeah, I believe it does. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks. And just another question um, from uh, from Haley is the exam. Do you have a sample exam? Because um, sometimes people are looking at when they're looking at the course. Is there a sample exam where people can see the kind of things that are covered? Yes, I have one just in my pocket. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you can just Google APMG um, um, Enterprise Big Data Exam. Um, also. Um, um, Haley can launch, uh, reach out to yourself or, or myself to, to gain a copy of the latest exam. We also supply the exam, a mock exam on the course as well. Um, so yeah, people could either pull down the exam from the internet or, or they can uh, uh, reach out to one of us. Um, but yeah, very important to do that mock exam before you do the real thing. So yeah, yeah, good question. Fantastic. That's it, that's all the questions so far, thank you. Fantastic, excellent. I can see a few more people have joined. So thank you so much guys for joining me. Um, we'll crack on with, Hopefully this slide will come up now. Artificial intelligence, there we go, a little bit of lag. Yes, yeah, so I've got a, got some, um, some great stories around AI. 
Um, first of all, let's define what AI is. So artificial intelligence, or AI for short, is the ability for computers to mimic the cognitive capabilities of a person. The good news is um, we don't have a lot of research and development at the moment in ethics and certainly in human emotions. That will come over time, which is really quite a good job. Otherwise, we'd be seeing a rise of the Terminator really soon. Um, I remember watching a document, um, I think it was Q&A, ABC Q&A yesterday, and that question was posed. And uh, I think the answer for me is no, the Terminator is not coming anytime soon. Um, but certainly there are some um, great leaps forward in AI. And, and certainly there's a concern that many jobs will be lost, but I think or probably more jobs will be gained than will be lost. And we've seen that in a number of in, in different revolutions over, over time. Let's move on to um, some specifics around AI. All AI models need to be trained and they need to be trained regularly. Um, so there is a maintenance aspect to artificial intelligence. There are basically two types of techniques that you can, you can use or two groups of techniques. And you can see those on your screen in front of you. We have machine learning, um, which is an older set of techniques that's using uh, mathematical algorithms to help computers learn. And the more modern concept is deep learning. Um, deep learning is around using neural networks. You can see those two are quite different. We're going to focus on deep learning today, mainly because um, that's it's probably a more interesting area. Um, machine learning can get a little bit complicated. And so I just want to keep it brief for you guys today. So on the screen now are some examples of neural networks. Um, so deep learning is a method that uses a neural network. A neural network is very simply a mathematical model of the human brain. So what you're looking at in front of you are a series of, if you like, circles. They represent neurons in the brain. And you can see interconnecting lines that represent the pathways in the brain. The pattern and the type of neurons needs to be carefully selected by a data scientist. And as you can see there, you're just seeing a very small sample. Of them. There are thousands of these different neural networks you can choose. You basically choose them depending on the type of use case and the type of business problem you're looking to solve. Because there are thousands of these patterns, you really do need data science expertise. So the scope of the course, we won't be covering how we choose these neural networks and, and what the different types are, but we certainly talk about the basics of how they work and how you might employ them um, to gain business benefit. Struggling to remember your partner's birthday? Well, that's because that part of your neural network in your brain is not so strong. So reinforcing that pathway is really, really important. So in AI, we have to do the same. We have to reinforce that learning and re retrain the model every so often because things are changing all the time and humans are learning all the time. Therefore, the AI models need to learn all the time. I'm going to talk about a specific use case now. Um, let's talk about spam. And I don't mean the Monty Python spam, which you see on the screen. I mean email spam. So to give you an example, we could use a neural network to determine which email is spam and which email is non-spam. The data scientist would need to work through gathering enough data um, to ensure that we have the best business outcome. Ensuring we have the right amount of data um, and the right data is called sampling. Very important that we have a, a large enough sample size so that the modeling is very, very accurate. The scientist would typically spend um, much of his time cleaning up the data. So removing nulls, corrupt fields, NAs, not applicables, any sort of form of corruption in the data, anything that could upset the final outcome. This tends to account for 80% of the data scientist's time, leaving about 20% for them to moan about that. The network is then trained using uh, the data set. So we identify in the data set which areas of the data are spam and which are non-spam. We then put it through the neural network. At first, the learning appears random, um, but over time, um, the, the deep learning will eventually understand what the correlations are in its neural network and start to output the correct responses. We would then apply that to a, a validation and testing set to ensure we're getting the right results. 
and then we would prototype that and basically scale that up slowly over time to ensure our model is optimal. The challenge with any sort of um, artificial intelligence or any sort of uh, data science is bias. Bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, is a huge risk when, when humans, not just data scientists, but any sort of resources are collecting data. We want to uh, avoid bias. Bias is the tendency to favor one thing over another. Um, and often it's unconscious. Um, it often manifests itself in a skewed data set. So the, the uh, slide you see in front of you is an example of that type of skew. So in this data, we may assume that this should be a uniform distribution. Uh, we call that a Gaussian or normal distribution, um, which basically means it's symmetrical. You can see it's skewed there to the right, which is negative skew. So we could infer that some form of bias. Bias is undesirable as it in introduces inequality. So it's important that we try and remove any bias from our data. Next use case you, you may be a little bit more familiar with is the autonomous car use case. So this is a real screenshot from the Tesla Model S, I think it is demonstrator video. It's produced about two or three years ago and it's showing um, on the left hand side the driver um, and the view that the driver has. On the right hand side, you're seeing the artificial intelligence engine working its magic. The green boxes are in-path objects, objects that it believes are a risk or a hazard, and the blue objects are out-of-path objects. Basically, the model here is working through and making autonomous decisions. Um, if you Google, if you go to Tesla website, you'll find this video. It's about two, two and a half years old, and it clearly shows, I think it's about four minute video showing uh, four minutes of self-driving capability on real roads in California. I lied when I said I wasn't going to talk about machine learning. I'm just going to touch on it here. Um, there are two types of machine learning. There's unsupervised learning and supervised learning. On the right hand side are just some different techniques that we could use depending on the outcome we're trying to look for. Most of my experience um, in the data science world has been around supervised learning. Um, you'll learn more about those techniques and what they mean on the course and I'll give you some real Examples. So I am ready for another set of questions. Do we have any more or should we keep moving? No, we do have a question. And that question, Martha, it says, how do I convince my boss of the value of big data and to take the course? So uh, thinking about what you've just said, you've, you've encapsulated what the course is, but convincing a boss. Now I have answered um, to everyone that said, look, it's a great question, but I would, one aspect is the syllabus that you have from the course really shows what the course is about and what it's intended to. But Paul, you must have had this sort of question with people thinking about coming to the course. How have you answered it? Yeah, so what's what's really important is to have, a, a, I, I guess, an open conversation with whoever's phoned in the course and, and important that you baseline um, or, or agree some measures for before and after course. So for example, if you're um, wishing to build awareness around big data in your organization, and there's a specific maybe business objective that aligns to, um, and that can be one way of gaining the funding. So for example, if there's some sort of business objective around improving quality of data, um, and there are specific objectives in the course around that metric, you can then measure either that person or the group of people before the course, and then measure maybe in a year's time, the quality of data and what impact that those those people had on, on the impact of that data. It really depends what the business objective is. So the most important thing is to tie in um, the learnings or the knowledge from the course into a business objective, measure it before, measure it afterwards, and that effectively measures your turn on investment. Um, hopefully that, that helps. Um, no, that's good. Yeah, good. But you, cer you certainly also see some testimonials of people going to the course. So I'd urge anyone to contact either um, Paul or myself um, because there's a number of things that we can pass on and, and give you assistance without getting that funding. So I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Good. On to, on to the next section then, Paul. Fantastic. So um, I'm going to give you a taste now. The next two sections we're going to talk about, this section is statistics, and give you a bit of flavour of um, how, how I might run the course. So um, just wait for the slide to pop up. So I know what you're thinking. Everybody, when you mention the word statistics, the hairs go um, raise up on the back of your neck and you remember those, I do anyway, I remember those horrible days at school uh, where math seemed really difficult and statistics in particular was very, very difficult to understand. Um, 
So one of the, the, the things that I do in the course is we tell a number of different stories. Um, I'll talk about some uh, my, my music experience and my technology experience um, and even some of my stand up comedy experience. And you'll start to see statistics in those areas. Um, so there are specific examples I'm going to share with you in a moment around storm damage and around my SES volunteering. So I think the key to um, um, understanding uh, and imparting knowledge on a course is always through storytelling. We also then have uh, practical examples that we'll work through and real questions, as well as I always keep it two way feedback, always asking people, what do you think? What does statistics mean to you? You know, what challenges have you had over your career around statistics? And those answers can vary from, um, I know a lot about statistics, so I don't know, no, I don't know hardly anything. Talk, talk me through them. So statistics very simply is all about numbers. And it's all about how you can see patterns in those numbers. Patterns are really, really important for mankind. Um, it's helped us survive for many, many thousands of years. In fact, the indigenous culture of Australia, 60,000 years, they are constantly, their, their songs and their culture is all around recognition of patterns. Um, if we could detect patterns and predict what those patterns are going to look like, then that can help us, or it has helped us to survive. In business, it helps us um, disrupt our competitors and helps us to stay in business. So at the human level, the types of things that we've traditionally looked at have been predicting weather patterns, predicting where sources of food um, um, may, may, be, may manifest themselves, and the types of hunting techniques that we could apply. If you think about those, they're little, those are like little experiments. You know, We think about what worked last time, what's going to work for us next time. Um, six months ago, what type of weather did we have? When could we grow crops? All those types of things. Um, if we can detect patterns and understand them, it helps us survive. And it's no different in a business context. It's all because of statistics. So let me give you a example, an example of a statistical technique. Um, you may have heard of linear regression. This is what you see on the slide, and I'm sure it probably is putting the fear of God into most people. But let me break this down. It's a fantastic technique for predicting future outcomes. It's very simple. So let's say um, I have um, I want to predict the probability of a storm occurring in Brisbane. Um, so the first thing I, I do, and I've, I've actually done this, I'd harvest the data from the Bureau of Meteorology, do some initial analysis um, and uh, write down sort of the uh, the leads, if you like, of where I think um, I could take the, the data. Now, I know from my SES knowledge, um, so again, it's often combining data science with some sort of domain knowledge. That's really, really important. Um, so in this case, it's my SES, uh, storm damage knowledge. Um, and I know there's a correlation between the probability of a storm occurring and a drop in air pressure. So guess what? I ran an experiment. I decided to buy, if you can see this guys, decided to buy a little, um, a little watch or big watch actually, um, that measures um, barometric pressure. You can tell I'm a geek, right? Um, so every time the air pressure, let's say it was at 1,030 HPA and it dropped to say 1,010 HPA, typically a range of say 20 HPA, I would check on my watch that this was the case and then I would write the numbers down. I would then plot the numbers on a chart. So on your screen, it's not the real chart, but there's an example of a chart there with an X and a Y axis, and I'm putting all those different dots in. So the, the bottom axis could be the probability of a storm, and the left um, central axis um, could be the pressure drop. Um, so you plot them all on a, uh, uh, a lovely graph, and then what you do with linear regression, you find what's called the line of best fit. Um, and that's essentially what you'll see drawing there. This is linear regression. Um, we don't talk about complex mathematics on the course. We don't talk about the representation of linear regression in mathematics. mathematics. Uh, we simply um, understand the basics around how to plot and how to draw that line. This is linear regression. You simply plot your data onto a graph and place a line of best fit. Now, the reason this line is important is it now means if I have another data point, like a pressure drop, I could plot on the graph, and if it falls close to the line, I can determine the probability of, the, of that storm. 
at some stage in the next few years, once I find some time, I decide that I'm going to write an app on this and actually um, let everyone have it for free and, and calculate that storm vulnerability. It, 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 you can say it's a simple technique, um, but it'd be great to do that. And that's it for statistics. So any more questions before I move to the final section? No, we're pretty right there, Paul. Can proceed on. Excellent. So let, let's let's move on to social media. So um, it was about three years ago I, I embarked on a journey to learn more about social media and set myself a goal. Um, so one of these goals um, was to become an influencer online. In other words, um, understand how social media worked and then take a subject like cloud computing or data science, become uh, more well known um, for my knowledge in that area. So what I did um, is I learned, first thing I did was learn R. So R is a programming language um, that we use in data science. There are basically two languages that people tend to specialize in, either Python or R. I went for R just because the uh, learning curve was much smaller. Python for me was a little bit of a, uh, a longer learning curve. So I coupled R programming. So I did, I, well, let me backtrack. I did a course, first of all, um, online. In fact, a number of courses with the John Hopkins University. Um, I learned R programming. I learned a number of statistical techniques. And so I wanted to apply those with my experience. So you notice how we're applying a big data technique or knowledge with some domain expertise. So I've been a solution architect for many years. I've been a musician for many years. And those transferable skills and those learnings coupled with our programming um, allowed me to understand what it would take or set some goals as to what I think an influencer would look like. Let me be clear by influencer, I mean someone um, that's um, well known online for a particular area of expertise. Um, I don't mean sending, uh, selling Ralph Lauren sunnies or Gucci sunnies, um, which is what some people I think uh, define as an influencer on, on certainly Instagram. This was also focused on Twitter. So let me uh, talk through some of my achievements. And then I'll talk through some of the key points around how I, I achieve that with data science. So I used a social media charting system called rise.global. So very, very important with any sort of uh, science that you measured before and afterwards. So the measurement initially would have been, I think, um, let's take the top 1000 bloggers. I was probably, I don't know, 180 or 200 maybe in the world. I did a little bit of blogging, but I wasn't very high up on the charts. You can see here, I'm 30th now in the, in the world. Um, and you can see the stats there speak for itself. Um, and the important thing is it's not just the data science. It was coupled with hours and hours of hard work. Um, but the data science, if you like, gave me an edge. It allowed me to learn faster than many other people. Um, so it meant I could create R code. In other words, I can set up little experiments. I can run those experiments, harvest data, um, draw hypotheses from those data, and then test them out in, in, in reality by doing different things. Let me talk about some of those things, um, if you like, I did differently, some of the rules um, that I derived. What's interesting, though, is I didn't use any deep learning or machine learning techniques. That, at the outset, I, I really wanted to try and apply those, but I realized that they weren't appropriate techniques for social media. I think part of the reason is because it's very, very complex social media. It's about people. It's about psychology. Um, so I had to learn about psychology and to understand those components in tandem with some of the data science. So the three things I want to share with you. First thing I was able to do was derive rules using classification and clustering techniques. So you see on the diagram there, uh, we talked about machine learning composing of those four components. Um, so you've got discrete at the top, continuous at the bottom. Uh, what you don't see is the left hand side and right hand side differentiates between supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, so classification and clustering were the, the main techniques. Social media dealing with discrete data. Like, for example, you either like something or you don't. That's a one or a zero. Continuous data is very much scientific data. So very much what I was able to do was to make a controlled post um, and then using a little bit of R code, understand the effectiveness of that post. Was I getting high engagement? Was I getting lots of likes? Um, was I getting engagement from influencers that I maybe had identified? Were there any correlation factors? Um, secondly, understanding who the most influential people were. So again, this is the non-data science side of things. This is the subject matter expertise. 
to understanding um, for say for cloud computing and for data science who the influencers were and then talking to them and engaging with them online because that increases your social score online and so I used a number of third-party tools um, and data science skills I think I, I, I worked my way through 50 different tools um, that I found online many of them were free many of them were targeted at social media in the end um, I chose uh, two of them and they're the ones that I use Things I was looking for were um, in the posts were looking at hashtags as well, looking at sentiment analysis along those influences um, and, and potentially other factors. And also understanding the types of analytics that those tools provide. Um, so although the tools don't require any coding, you have to understand a little bit about visualization and data science to understand whether those graphics are really going to help achieve what you need to achieve. So it's always very important to have a goal at the outset. Third thing is I ran a series of experiments to determine the effects of those different types of content. So what have I learned from that whole experiment? It's pretty much a three year experiment and it's always ongoing. Um, having a sound knowledge of data science and data analytics has helped me understand the importance of data. However, you always have to couple it with subject matter expertise. So you need to know something about social media about influencing, about psychology. The same will be true of music. And you can see with the storm damage example, that was the same. And it would be the same in your business. So data science isn't a silo. It's very much a business objective that you need to work through with your subject matter experts. Applying the big data knowledge to tool selection. So 50 tools, I was able to go through and understand um, what types of data were meaningful um, and to work through that entire process. Um, as a result, like I said, I, I end up paying for just two tools now to those 50 and, and I still use two or three free ones. Most important with social media is to be authentic. So that's the subject matter expert psychological aspect of it. Psychology and data science work in tandem. Finally, the biggest learning from social media is it's a great test ground, right? You can try out things uh, without risk. You know, you can just set up a Twitter account and you can try posting things, you can try gathering data, you can practice a lot of your techniques that you'll learn on the big data framework, not just the course, but the entire series, you can apply those to social media and you can run those little experiments. So perfect for learning and proving. Finally, this is most important, data science will never be a silver bullet. Silver bullets, I, I believe, don't exist, they're figments of your imagination. They're like ghosts. Um, so anybody that promises you um, a result with a particular single technique um, run away. Um, and that's it for me. Any final questions from anyone in the course? Uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, look, you certainly uh, demystified some aspects there about data management. I like the link, it probably links back to that previous question, how you can convince your boss to, to come to the course. Linking that with social media is probably a really interesting, uh, having a better understanding. You've seen an improvement already from some of the aspects you've got from the data harvesting. Yeah, ab absolutely right. So um, the important thing I think with any sort of business goal as well, social media being a strong one around marketing is to measure where you are, measure where you wanna go. Um, the, the other place where social media tends to, uh, sorry, the data science tends to figure heavily is, is sales. So how do my sales come into my organization from my marketing plan? Which of those convert, which of those don't? And that's a huge data science sort of uh, business case in itself, because if you can convert more of the leads um, using data science techniques and technologies, not just necessarily tools you've written yourself, but possibly off the shelf tools too. And, and you say you're able to gain 30% more of your leads, convert 30% more of your leads, that's real money. So there's another, another business case. There's quite a few of them. Good. Two more questions. Um, is there a professional association for data managers? The person said, you whet my appetite now and I'm, I'm keen to do the course, but I'm also keen to see if there's a, a, another association or something. Yes, there's DAMA, D-A-N-A. -A. Um, so the Data Management Association. Um, they have uh, branches all over Australia. Um, I'm based in Brisbane, so I think we'll have one here in Brisbane. Um, that's a really good resource. Um, so just Google DAMA, Dharma, um, Australia, and, and have a look. Um, another great resource, a less formal one, is uh, attend meetup groups, uh, particularly if you're interested in, in, in data science. So I've attended quite a few um, Power BI and Agile and data science sort of meetups in Brisbane. And I've met some fantastic people. I've even actually got some business out of uh, meeting those people. So it's 
it's been yeah that that they're, they're, they're my top two tips for people looking to uh, become to find other other like-minded people fantastic paul uh, just the last question um your original slide said there's some other levels of certification um that looks interesting we're just doing with this one are they when are they coming on board do you have any idea or the, the type of uh, content yeah. Uh, absolutely. Let me just flick back, just to remind people of those uh, four. Let's have a little look. That will come through. Yeah, so we talked about the enterprise big data professional. So we've got the big data analyst. That's the next one. Then the big data scientist and then the big data engineers. Those, those three are currently being worked on um, and they will contain practical elements. Um, it's not clear yet whether they'll be Python or R. Probably there'll be a choice of the two because people tend to pick their they're poison for me or it may be R, uh, but there's certainly things to think about. If you're serious about data analysis, if you're serious about being a scientist or an engineer, then those are the certs to go for. Um, and obviously, the big, the big data professionals are the one to start with and, and see where you guys go. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, uh, Paul, we've uh, probably reached our time. Thank you so much on behalf of APMG and also any other closing comments you'd like to make and before we, we finish the webinar? Um, just to thank you, Laurie, for um, your fantastic MC and your introduction, and to thank those people on the call. Um, I think we have we have yeah we have a number of people on the call. Thank you so much for your time today. Please reach out uh, to me. I'm on LinkedIn, so my name. I think you think my badge is Paul Colmer. Feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or, or social media, and I can ask any of your questions. So I'd love to meet you all in person one day, and maybe we'll see you on a course with me sometime soon. So thank you, Laurie.